All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Una Hathaway's paper. And by a little bit, I mean this is going to be pretty long. It's an 87-page paper. It's called Secrecy's End. It came out very recently. You probably didn't read it unless you're very into this field. But just in case, let's give it a little shot. All right, so uh, Bell La Padula, it, it was amazing, like, seeing like this very computer science security technical term come up in a law paper and I enjoyed it a lot but I think it was I won't say misused I'll say very weird it was a little weird right because it doesn't fit the problem and it doesn't fit the solutions we have right now and it may have been I don't know if it was something they were thinking about when they designed clearances but I'm not going to get into computer science theory that's honestly that's an entire different YouTube channel um, let's talk about secrecy and what it means for all of us and the f the paper is divided into about three parts uh, I give the paper an A by the way if you're gonna get like it's in the review uh, spreadsheet as an A because um, it's a very good paper I think there's a couple gaps we'll talk about those gaps so the system of clearances and classifications comes up over and over again in almost every area of cybersecurity policy. So if you study cybersecurity policy and you don't have a good understanding of this, then you have this huge gap. And I admit I did not have sort of the legal and historical understanding that I do now after having read the paper. Um, obviously, I worked at the National Security Agency and have dealt with classified materials, so I had more of a practitioner's understanding. But this is a very, it's very good to uh, see where all of this stuff comes from and what it looks like on a broader figure. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what she talks about and a few other things. But before we do that, I want to like talk about the root cause of so many of the issues of the classification and clearance problem, which is... The actual issue is that you can combine multiple unclassified statements to come up with something that's super secret. That's a problem for all of these systems is that not only like the, the, the dissolution and the combination of, of information can be done sort of multidimensionally and you come up with different levels of how sensitive that information is going to be. This is the whole goal of an intelligence organization is to gather up lots of different pieces of very not sensitive information and combine them via analysis into something that's uh, secret or actionable. Um, so I find the fact is if your classification problem doesn't handle these issues, just the, the root cause of it, it's always going to have uh, an applicability issue. Applicability meaning, is it fit for purpose? Does it solve the problem that you need it to solve? Right. So that's step one, is understanding that these things are, are uh, broad abstractions on top of a very difficult problem. So let's look at um, the tangled history. And if you're reading it, it's interesting because a lot of law comes from a place of, of pain and, uh, and never gets fixed. And that's very, very true with classification and clearance law. But the other problem is it's extremely key to how our government functions. So if we get into its origin story, which is like Magneto, and I chose Magneto because uh, Magneto is the one who is born because of World War II, right? This the historical story of Magneto, or not historical, the uh, Marvel comic story of Magneto is that he was a Jewish kid and uh, went through a concentration camp, right? So, um, so uh, the, the, the beginnings of the classification program really were at some level quite xenophobic, right? They, were, they really started out of uh, a fear of the Japanese before and during World War II. Uh, and previous to that, uh, just in general, that, like weirdly enough, the Espionage Act predates uh, class like classification markings, which I think is very interesting. So the other problem you see is that with a lot of laws, they have trouble with scale, right? So 
there was a massive upscale, what we call derivative classification, which is when you write a classification or a, a document based on another classified document. Um, so in the 1990s, essentially everything ramps up as we get sort of industrialized around these processes. And now we're in a place that's very weird. So let's look at the law. The law, like the 1917 Espionage Act, uh, applies to, like, for example, a bunch of different stuff, but also to people who have the secrets. So it's not about foreign spies. It's about foreign and domestic people and how they handle what we consider secret. That's it. It's sort of super broad. It says handling secret information improperly is illegal and has criminal and civil issues. Um, so the civil is important because with civil stuff, they can like pre-grab your your stuff, right? They can seize it if it's civil or something. There's, there's like a legal determination there beyond my law understanding. Um, so, but the other side of the story is that obviously if you're, if you're at all conversant with American law, you know that we have this thing called the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is written very broadly and is usually a trump card for almost all things. Um, but this law, for some reason, has been uh, ruled by the Supreme Court to essentially trump the First Amendment, right? So that is, that is why it holds almost any power, right? Because otherwise, if someone was going to release information, they would just say, well, I have a First Amendment right to release this information, which is, you know, like the naive reading would say that you probably do. Um, okay, so... Uh, the structure of the law is that Congress enacted, like saying that secret information causes criminal issues, but all of the rest of it is done via executive orders. So what is secret? How does secret stuff work? How does declassification work? Who can access it? All that stuff is just executive orders, which on one hand is good because as the world changes and you need to change all of your executive structures around it, you can fit your, your secret information, because at some level an agency is just an information processing engine, right? So you can fit all of your secret information and manipulate it the same way you manipulate everything else in the U.S. government via the, you know, sole executive. But the downside is, is because it's not really specified and executives are political beasts, they can do a bunch of things. So it's sort of, it's both good and bad. And when it's bad, it's very bad. And, and it's not me saying this. This is a lot, of, all of this is reflected in the text of the paper. So let's talk about the issues that she points out. Uh, I, I guess I'm guessing ahead of pronouns right now, but that Una points out. Um, and one of the problems is that massive, massive overclassification is the norm because underclassifying something would be considered, you know, criminally, criminally liable at a minimum. Right, or like administratively, you would get punished, um, and this is not. This is something that that literally everybody points out as they, you know, at every port of the system. Right, like you know, from your first day at work to you're the head of the CIA and NSA, which Michael Hayden was, you know, like everyone knows that the 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 labels on the emails and other things you're getting are not what they should be. Right, so they, they're not. They're not accurate, which is a very big problem. And when they're not accurate, they're usually not accurate, almost always not accurate in the, in the more classified realm. And the scale of the system is just unwieldy. Four million cleared Americans. That's a number that should just baffle you that we built a system that is trying to do this. Um, and a never ending backlog of documents in theory, Documents are supposed to be getting declassified, but there's no way to do it at this scale. Um, and the, the penalties are, are sort of harsh, but they're also arbitrary and subjective. And what that gives you is an executive system that can be very politically driven, which is not really what you want as an American, right? So like every four to eight years, if you swap administrations, you know, you could like killing the careers of whoever came before you, right? So that's very weird. And Una's uh, thesis is that this is a, 
a clear and present threat to democratic values, one, and policy understanding, two, and then three, stated a little bit less powerfully, national security in general, right? So the fact that the system isn't working means national security is not being served, which I think is the best argument to use when looking to revise a system like this, because the system does not want to give up power. So let's talk, uh, we're going to go into depth here. So if you need to get a coffee or something, pause the video, get a coffee. We're, go we're going down. We're going down the rabbit hole. It's 87 pages. We're going to talk about 83 of them. So the balance of powers, it's completely broken. You as a congressperson don't need a clearance because you've been elected. But your staff do. And how useful are you without staff? Right. So when you even when you start the office, it might take I mean, it takes like two years to get a TS. Right. So uh, the, re the reality is you may not be getting able to serve your country properly because you cannot get clearances for your people. Uh, and in theory, you know, an administration could strip the clearances of the other party's congressional staff. It's not something that anyone's done, but they could do. Uh, and again, Congress, part of Congress's role is to inform the U.S. people, and they can't release information. In fact, I mean, the way the law and the system are written, as, as, she, as Una presents it, is that because of how arbitrary it is, in theory, they could selectively um, uh, prohibit, you know, different, all sorts of things. They can cause any problem they want with Congress if you have uh, executive power. So that's an issue. And it's not an issue that no one's noticed. This is, these are all issues um, that both parties have pointed out are just, just totally broken. And from Hillary Clinton to Donald Rumsfeld to Donald Trump, everybody has said that clearances are broken. It's, and that's why I think this paper is so important. So this, I mean, if you think about it, 4 million people at a time, so what this means is that like 1.2 to 1.5 percent of the U.S. population, not even of the working U.S. population, but just of the whole, including babies, right? So 1.2 percent of the whole population are in this bucket. That, in theory, they should all be doing pre-publication review. It's very, it's, it's just, you know, for even their blogs, right? Like, um... It's just unlikely. The scale is just unlikely to be effective. The selective prosecution. You know, I've always said this, and it's, like, been a point of contention with, with some of my friends, which is that, like, I've always said, like, look, clearances and classifications are more about figuring out who's on team than anything else, right? So it's almost tribal. Um, and, and I... And at some level, that's what people are seeing. Like, uh, the scope of criminal liability is just mind-boggling. Uh, but it's not just that. It's not just the criminal liability. It's also that um, the administrative liability and the civil liability, as they talk about here earlier. And the administrative liability is almost, the, like having your clearance yanked, is almost the worst one. I have a friend, and I'm not going to name him this time, I usually do name him in this story. I have a friend who worked with me at the National Security Agency. Uh, in the less, like, I, he was doing similar work to me, but in sort of uh, a different organization. And he was doing research on vulnerabilities, and so he downloaded something from a uh, unclassified area, and he was analyzing it on his classified computer and because of what it was, you know, they're like, oh, you're looking at a vulnerability, which was his job. Uh, they actually temporarily yanked his clearance, and he was told that he could get a job uh, doing, like, lawn care and gravel shaping in the parking lot, or he could take leave. And so he just took all of his leave. Um, I, I, that sort of activity, like, there was no reason to suspect he was disloyal as opposed to just... They were someone was following some sort of procedure that is essentially brutal to the employees. We have a recruitment and retainment problem, and clearances and classifications are a huge, huge, colossal part of that. And the answer is not always just to grow the number of people 
that you you or suck dry you know all of the available talent from you know information security companies sometimes it's finding a way to make your own culture more accepting and more um able to 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 keep people be nicer being nicer i, I actually was watching a uh, grade school graduation today and I'm like we need to just learn to be nicer um, so uh, th this is something that you see is that like the administration whatever administration is of your group or of the country can tilt information in different ways by messing with the clearances so this is the CIA one is the obvious one um, this is something that you'll see here which is that uh, you know, charging Assange has, has uh, as much as, it doesn't matter what your feelings are about him personally. Uh, he's not an American citizen. Uh, they're charging him under an act, and the reading of that act has always been very, like, the way the Justice Department says is, it's just that, like, we won't prosecute journalists. But there's nothing in the law that says they can't. They absolutely can, and if they want to, they will. Um, it's extremely broad in the root law so the argument here is that the law is so broad that it it should get revised because it shouldn't be this broad in any democracy so that's an it should not allow you to prosecute just random people who have received the information that's something that's a problem and i and, and i think a side problem we don't want to talk about is the blue team blindness as we call it which is when shadow brokers post something people who are in the industry but have a clearance are not allowed to read it. And I'm not saying they're not allowed to read it and comment on it because that's straight up makes sense. You don't want to confirm or deny. But they're not even allowed to read it, which I think is really bad for a number of reasons. And she does not mention that in the paper itself, but I'm sure she's aware of it. Uh, Pre-publication review. There's a lot in this document about pre-publication review. Una very obviously thinks pre-publication review is totally broken. I completely agree with her. Um, you're sending potentially classified information to an unclassified email account in an unencrypted way. If they don't like it, they can, can come and take your laptop. That's annoying. Uh, otherwise, they just black out whatever they want. I've never actually had a problem with pre-publication review, and it's been pretty fast for me. But the things I've submitted have been very limited. So um, they, they had to kind of relate to something I was working on during my time, which was very limited um, at the National Security Agency. Uh, you know, one thing that I don't think she mentions anywhere in the paper is that a very common symptom of the clearance and classification program is that people develop stutters because your brain is going through, your brain's under such stress, it's going through all these filters to try to figure out what you can say, what you can't say, where are you, that people... I've seen this time and time again, develop a stutter. And I, I did for a while as well. It, it's, it's, it's a really common thing. And I think that speaks to the amount of stress this puts individuals, four million individuals under, is that they're trying to self-filter so hard that they're getting verbal uh, ticks. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak for other people, but I definitely, it was definitely been something that I've thought was very interesting. Um, it is well known. She does not have a, uh, um, I guess she does have a citation for this, and I didn't read it, that writings that express views favorable to the government are likely to preferential treatment. This is just, that's horrible. Like, I get it. I get, because, you know, the people doing this are in, um, you know, and, and you'll notice in the Trump administration, they swapped out the people doing pre-publication review for people who were more uh, Trumpy, right? So that's, this is just a very weird thing that it really should be set to be completely objective if you could possibly work that. Um, so uh, very weird, right? Um, and again, the way, the, this is sort of a fit for purpose question, which is, that former government employees then have to make very tough decisions about how they're going to deal with the system because they can't put every, this video in theory, right? They can't put every little video and thing they do through pre-publication review. It's not, a, it's not a lifestyle that anyone can do. So is the system fit for its intended purpose? 
And the point of this video is not just to, to bang or, or explain the paper, which is just banging on the clearance system, but it's also to look, look at the national security ramifications of some of these things. So the system does not protect the information most worth protecting. Now she goes on in this paper to discuss that the system doesn't protect enough information that's in the private area. But I would say the truth is that the set of information that the government holds that is worth protecting is also not well protected by the system. There's a mismatch between what it understands needs to be protected and what it doesn't, right? It, it doesn't understand that the pizza's deliveries are important, right? So this is not understanding what you what is important in terms of your information is a really bad sign. But her case is that uh, the classification scheme doesn't really look at private data and the private data is what people are exploiting. Which is true, but it's not just going to be via exploitation. It's also going to be generation of that information, right? So anything, anytime China operates, for example, a big website, they're gathering information and they can then utilize that information as part of their system. So how do we understand what is available to your adversary and what isn't and then adjust your clearance system to fit that? And I think the only way to do that is to get more more tight-knit, to, to reduce what you're trying to control, uh, which is a very difficult decision to make. So administrative penalties. Um, Una points out that like corporations don't have access to criminal law except in the most severe case. And so what they're looking at is you know basic civil law and, and administrative penalties. Like you'll get fired if you don't obey your NDA, you probably won't get sued because there's no value to that unless it's like a humongous deal, right? So um, there's a few things that I felt were missed in the paper, one of which is the traffic light protocol, which is a very formalized protocol, right? So traffic light, if, you, if you've not been in the incident response world, traffic light protocol, so there's like, you know, uh, I don't actually know all the things, but like black is definitely don't talk about it. White is you can talk about it. And there's stuff in the middle too, right? So within your group, it works really well. It's like a surprisingly adhered to system. Uh, it's based essentially on the honor system and on reputation, right? So if you're known for having violated the TLP, you will not receive information in the future. Essentially, you're out of the system. Um, uh, that's, it works very well, but it's also a little fuzzier because like, you know, reputations can be repaired. And I think that's something that you don't, you don't want to have to make an, a massive administrative process. So there were a lot of things that you could fix that were not in the paper. And I think another paper should probably be written a smaller paper, much more focused on what is happening in the real world. How does, how do we fit to purpose a system that's better? And how do we get better recommendations for actual new systems that we could put in place? So um, this is definitely something that you're going to see. I want to talk about a couple bonus problems, which is that clearances shape the market and essentially keep us from utilizing our small businesses, and individual contractors, uh, the way they need to be used if we're going to build the fifth generation systems that we need. So um, this is a huge issue. You can't just leverage Raytheon and Mantech and L3 and the rest. You need these small contractors to be able to hold clearances or have a system where they don't have to hold clearances. So that that's a huge deal. Uh, and, and I know someone right now is saying, well, they can just subcontract to Raytheon. And I'm like, they can't because there's no profit margin that way. It's all risk, no reward for them. Um, Clearances are the one-way door, right? So I don't know. I know so many people who have a clearance and are, you know, doing great work who, who don't want to have a clearance. They just don't because the, the, the risk level and the, it's like the stress that comes from all that is so onerous that they would do anything to get rid of it. And so we see talent just bleed out the front door and it never comes back. 
and clearances disappear in five years if you're not using them. What happens when they disappear? Oh, you just stay in private industry because getting your clearance takes another two years, right? So it's sort of like, even though we have 4 million people in the system, are they the right 4 million people is something you should ask yourself, right? Like this is a strategic risk. So that's the current horrible state. There's a lot of problems, a lot of them, and they deserve to be addressed. You can read the paper to get a much more, you know, lengthy <laughs> and, and coherent statement on it, but they deserve to be addressed. But no one will talk, it's like the third rail of dealing with this policy, right? When you talk to this, the Solarium team, they're like, yeah, we couldn't touch that, it's too big, right? And I'm like, but you're supposed to be doing big things. Um, okay, possible revisions, here's her suggestions. I think the suggestions are, deserve discussion. I don't think they're complete or as detailed as they would need to be. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of that here. So. The three reform proposals. So she has some reform proposals, right? So she's like, stop hanging criminalization over everybody. There's no need for that. Um, automatically declassify more stuff. Just automatically declassify it. And then uh, a couple more tricky ones that I liked that were cool. So a non-negotiable date of 10 years for classification. This was a really hard one for me to read in the sense that I know of ODA vulnerabilities that have lasted 20, 25 years. Um, and so how do you protect your essentially sources and methods with this kind of, um, declassification? Does this mean that like assist, like the understanding of what systems that were hacked 10 years ago, 10 years is not that long. Um, so th this is a very, like, I don't think this is the answer. I don't think a time-based answer is the answer. It's worth thinking about, and I'd love to talk to her more about why, um, why you know she thought this was the right thing to do. So I'm actually going to have to ask her what her pronouns are now because I keep saying this anyway. Um, s congressional control of information, and I, I think, and judicial as well. I guess why not? I mean, deriving the getting it so that like the executive is not the one eye that gets to make a decision on all information, whether or not secret. And remember, they can classify something that's completely in the open source if they feel like it, right? Like that is how broad this power is. It is, it is a ridiculously high level of power and there's no reason for that. Um, and I think we've discovered the risks of giving the executive powers that are overly broad and abstract. And I hope everyone's on board with that because it's, it's not a great idea. Um, and then here, I don't think this is correct, an exception for journalists. Um, and I won't even say that Julian Assange is a journalist. I, I don't think it should matter necessarily though, right? Like. Is he a credentialed journalist? What does that even mean? These days, everyone writes a blog. Am I a journalist? I write blogs. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that's a good idea either. Um, but I also don't think uh, the random DOJ policies are, are what this, you know, this should be hanging off of. There should be a different kind of exception that is, um, you know, a public use exception, for example. Um, okay, so advantage uh, of prepub. We have to do something about prepublication review. It's weird. It shouldn't be the way it is. Um, and I don't know if this is the answer. Just sort of like make it, uh, make a, um, a swift way to seek and receive determination. And I think the only way to do that is to say, if, if the government doesn't respond within a day with a yes, no, then you know, and maybe give them seven no's a week or something, right? Like, so start, I, there's got to be some tweaks here. Those tweaks would have to be in legislation. Um, and maybe that would be the easiest first fix because pre-publication review is obviously broken and uh, is being used politically and is just, uh, just a horrible mess and could be fixed. It's not as complicated as the rest of it. This was thrown in, I think, 
artificial intelligence machine learning to identify cases of overclassification. I don't think that's the right use of machine learning in this particular case. And I, I just, there was just a lot of data labeling. You don't have, a, it, it, that's not gonna work. But um, that doesn't mean you can't use big data processing and statistical understanding to fix clearances. And, and I think there was a DARPA project on this already like where they were like, we can, we can rate you for trustworthiness from your Twitter feed or something, and we'll give you a TSSCI in a day, right? And, and if honestly, I think if you can't do TSSCI in a day, something's wrong with your system. So um, more radical way to shift in it incentives, cap and trade system for classified documents. This stuff's always great. I don't think it would, I don't think anyone would implement it. I, ju I just don't think so, but it would work. And the whole, you'll, one thing you'll notice in the entire, um, in the entire article is that they use the term documents over and over and over again as like a thing, the same way people working on PCI use records. Documents doesn't mean anything. Are you gonna measure it in pounds, right? Like a lot of that stuff, we need to think, how do I measure information? Maybe in bits, in entropy, right? I don't know. So uh, that's something that's going to annoy you if you're a computer scientist or um, as OCD as I am, I guess. Okay, so the Bell LaPontula thing, here's the mention of it. I just thought it was so great. Uh, how do you set up a computer system with different levels of security? But there's other systems. And if you look at how like computer systems have evolved over time, they've gone from like user group and everyone permissions like you see on a standard Unix system to much more granular permissions based systems that you're going to see on NT or on a modern Linux system with capabilities and all this other nonsense right thrown in. And what you'll see there is some capabilities become sort of what we call God capabilities where, and there was a paper that came out today or from someone on this where it's sort of like if you have this one capability you can do whatever you want on the system no matter what right so and understanding which capabilities are that important is uh very difficult so i would say right now there's not an automated system in the dod that can say who actually knows the most secrets and the most important secrets because it's not going to be the person with the highest clearances it's going to be a collection of someone who has the right clearances and I think when you explain that to policymakers, they will say, wow, we do not have the right risk understanding structure and that they're gonna be right. Um, so let's talk about the Chinese wall architecture, which is, is it's unfortunately named, but if we wanted to, to do something next, we would probably include something like that, which is more about understanding the combination of information that to avoid conflicts, right? But, the conflicts in this case would be understanding enough of the picture that you know the whole picture. Um, so that's, there's, there's a way to move to a hybrid and more modern architecture, right? So I think a real suggestion that came out of something like this paper would say, in the next five years, let's move to this different system where we have 100,000 people who are under a new regime that supersedes the old regime. And then we'll grow that over time and iterate on that instead of a one-size-fits-all old Unix-style permission system for four million people, right? We're running Solaris 2.4. No one wants to run SonOS 2.4 on like a real server doing lots of things, but that's what we're doing, right? So it's broken, time to fix it. The summary, the paper makes a very coherent argument that, that something should be done. I think it's a little weaker when it comes to what should be done, um, but that's just the nature of the discussion. We need to have a broader discussion that's not just a one-person paper. Um, and that's, that's the whole story. Uh, you can read her paper or you can just, you know, just l have listened to this video. You, you know, everything you need to know perhaps, and you can just go forward and make a good recommendation to how we would fix the actual classification and clearance system. And I think we're going to have to start with pre-publication review and move from there. Uh, but it should be done as soon as possible. I don't think we should accept our cyber policy people saying it's too hard or it touches too much or it's just too big. We got to get over that. We have to make big changes if we're going to succeed in the new world.
And so thank you for listening to this video. I hope you got something out of it. And this was a really good paper. So if you do want to read really good papers, I highly recommend it. Um, bye.